We are now just about a month and a half away from the Seattle Kraken expansion draft, and one thing that I know a lot of people are wondering, or at least people in Washington and the area around Seattle, is whether or not the Kraken will be getting any homegrown talent, or at least players from the state of Washington. And while we have talked about the possibility of Tyler Johnson coming over from the Tampa Bay Lightning via some kind of trade with some incentive from Tampa Bay, one name that is probably the most talked about of a potential homegrown player would be Mount Vernon's own TJ Oshie from the Washington Capitals. Now obviously, nothing is anywhere near certain when it comes to the possibility of TJ Oshie coming back to Seattle to play NHL hockey near where he grew up. And that's not even to mention the fact that he has now come out and publicly said that he wants to stay in DC and finish out his career there, where he has played the last six seasons. Obviously, there were a lot of fans that were somewhat disappointed to hear that, but I mean, this is a guy with a life of his own and he's been there for six years now, so it makes sense that he probably wouldn't want to do a whole lot of extra moving around. But whether it's TJ Oshie or not, the Seattle Kraken are likely to get a pretty good player from the Washington Capitals. And there still is quite a bit of a puzzle that they have to figure out on the forward end when it comes to who they're going to end up protecting from Seattle. And again, that still could very well include Oshie. The Capitals are yet another team, like most of the teams will be, that I think is again most likely to go the 7-3 protection route. And for them, it certainly is still on the forward end where they have quite a number of question marks as far as who they'll end up protecting and who they might start playing some chicken with when it comes to Seattle. But there still are a few pieces of that puzzle that do fit pretty well into place already. One of those obviously being Nicholas Backstrom who has a no movement clause so he would have to be protected. It's also fairly safe to say that Evgeny Kuznetsov is also probably going to end up protected. And you can also probably lock in Anthony Mantha who came over from the Red Wings at the trade deadline and was pretty impressive for the Capitals since coming over. As well as Tom Wilson, even with all of the uh, turmoil that surrounded him during the course of the season. And then with those last three protection spots, this is where things start to get pretty interesting. And we'll start to see the Capitals tip their hand a bit to just how desperate they are to keep that championship window at least cracked open for as long as they possibly can. This is already one of the older rosters in the NHL, but... Some of those older players are also very much core pieces to trying to make Stanley Cup runs in the next couple of years. A couple of those guys being Lars Eller, who I think is fairly likely to end up protected as well, as well as TJ Oshie. But at least at that last protection spot, they can hedge their bets a little bit and lean towards a guy that's more part of the future with someone like Daniel Sprong. Now this is certainly a seven-man protection list on the forward end for the Capitals that I would be pretty surprised if everyone agreed with, as there are certainly a couple of big question marks, one of being the fact that there's a pretty big name missing off of it, that being Alexander Ovechkin. Now, before you get too excited if you're a Kraken fan or too defensive if you're a Capitals fan, no, this does not mean that I think that there's actually a chance that Seattle could end up getting Alexander Ovechkin. No, instead, I think that there's actually a pretty decent chance that what could happen here is that the Capitals, with Ovechkin's cooperation, could play a bit of chicken with Seattle. And that's because for pretty much the first time in his entire career, Ovechkin is, at the end of this season, set to be an unrestricted free agent. And because he has been very vocal about the fact that he wants to be a one-franchise player and finish out his career with the Capitals, then with the expansion draft coming up, the Capitals can just leave him unprotected with him being an unrestricted free agent and assume that he won't stab them in the back and sign with Seattle, even though Seattle will have the flexibility to offer him quite a bit more money than what Washington could. But assuming he is true to his word and wants to stay with the Capitals, then they can have some sort of handshake under the table type of deal set up where the Capitals say, We'll sign you after the expansion draft, just don't sign with Seattle. Of course, as far as the rules are concerned, there's nothing stopping Seattle from picking him anyway, but they would still have to find a way to sign him to a contract, otherwise he can just go back to the Capitals and free agency after the expansion draft, in which case the Kraken basically end up getting no one from the Capitals. 
the Capitals have a number of other pretty good players that the Kraken would be missing out on if they took that big risk. So I don't think that if Ovechkin were to be available, the Kraken would think that they have much of a chance of getting him, even if they do give him a call just to kick the tires anyway. And of course, the entire reason for Ovechkin and the Capitals to try something like this, and Ovechkin's incentive to probably end up taking a bit of a pay cut to stay with the Capitals if this were to happen, would be to try to win another championship. And if that is their goal, then they're probably going to want to keep their core together as much as they can, which is why someone like TJ Oshie would probably end up protected, even though the contract that he's on definitely does not look like it's going to age particularly well. And I say that because Oshi is still on a contract that sees him earning $5.7 million through 2025, at which point he'll be pushing 40 years old. But still, at the age of 34, he is one of the primary contributors for the Capitals, so if they do want to keep that championship window open as much as possible, then keeping him on the roster is a definite must. And exposing him to Seattle, even with that contract, would definitely put that at risk. Moving over now to the defensive end, though, things are a little bit more straightforward here. Though there is a bit of a similar story contract-wise with the first guy on the protection list in John Carlson, who is at the age of 31, still on a contract that sees him earning $8 million per year through 2026. But again, if you want to keep that opportunity to win another Stanley Cup open, you got to keep this guy around. And then getting the second and third spots, I think Dmitry Orlov pretty much has one of them locked up. And then the third one, I think at this point, most likely goes to Justin Schultz. And then in goal, which is pretty much the one position for the Capitals that isn't dominated by older players with big contracts, the protection spot here goes to Ilya Samsonov. So with that, as we do now move to who that could end up exposing for the Kraken to pick from the Capitals, with that protection list on the forward end being far from a sure thing, the guy that is probably most likely to end up off of it of the seven I have protected would be TJ Oshie because of the state of his contract. Again, a big part of the draw of having TJ Oshie be the pick for Seattle here is that he's a fan favorite type of player, but more importantly that he is from Mount Vernon, which is near to Seattle. So having that homegrown talent type of player start off the Seattle franchise is definitely a big draw for a number of fans. But on top of that, Oshi has been a very solid player with a good long career. The 34-year-old has now played in 856 career games across 13 NHL seasons, in that time putting up 610 points, on 260 goals and 350 assists. So, I mean, it's not like he's been a superstar player or anything like that over the course of his career, but he still has offered pretty solid points production and a pretty strong two-way game throughout the course of his career. And again, still at the age of 34, is putting up points with 43 points in the 53 games that he played in this last season. Plus, throughout the course of his career, he has been a pretty consistent 20 goal scorer, even through this season in just 53 games. Even with 133 goal season back in the 2016-17 year. Plus, pretty decent possession stats, always being above 50% when it comes to Corsi percentage, even if sometimes just barely above 50%, but still with a career of 51.8. And although expected plus minus has only been measured for about half of his career so far, he still has managed a positive 29.2 there, which is definitely pretty substantially in the positive direction. Now, obviously, again, when recently he said that he wants to stay in D.C., Seattle fans were a little bit disappointed that he didn't want to come to Seattle, but again, that's fairly understandable, and I think that if he were to be exposed and picked by the Kraken, he would be all too happy to come back home and play for the Kraken, and would be a very good face of the franchise, at least for the first couple of years. But even with Oshi protected, another guy that the Kraken certainly could look at on the forward end, and one that doesn't have quite the contract downside that Oshi does, would be the guy whose spot Oshi would probably end up taking if he is protected in Garnett Hathaway. The 29-year-old winger has now played in just under 300 career games across six NHL seasons, mostly for the Calgary Flames, but spent the last couple of years in DC for the Capitals. In that time, he's gotten 74 points on 31 goals and 43 assists, so 
certainly nowhere near the points producer that even Oshi is, and obviously not quite the headline maker that he would be either. But while Hathaway may not be quite the same caliber of player that Oshi is, and certainly doesn't offer the same points production, one place where he does have Oshi beat would be in the physical aspect of the game, where he is definitely a guy that will throw his body around quite a bit, with already 828 career hits in again just under 300 games. Plus, when it comes to his advanced stats, it would seem that that level of physicality that he's been able to play with does seem to play to his advantage there, as he has a career Corsi 4 percentage just above 50 in the positive direction at 50.4. Granted, it does seem to go up and down year to year, as every other year he's significantly above 50, and then the following year he's significantly under it, but he did just have a 47.4, so maybe that means if he came over to Seattle, he would bounce back and look pretty good there. Plus, his expected plus minus over the course of his career has almost always been positive, and the career number is 21.6, which again is pretty solid. Now again, even though I am saying these two could flip spots on the protection list, I'm not saying that Hathaway is anywhere near the same player that Oshi is, but one place where Hathaway certainly is an improvement over Oshi is in the contract department where he's only set to earn one and a half million dollars through 2023, so that does offer the Kraken quite a bit more flexibility when it comes to the cap. Plus, he still is a pretty solid player and would fit into, again, the physical defensive type of game that the Kraken are likely to play for the first couple of seasons at the very least. As far as cheaper options on the forward end go, though, Hathaway is not the only one. And if the Kraken do want a little bit more of a point scorer rather than a physical player that doesn't do as much for points, then Connor Sherry could help them out there. A smaller winger who will be turning 29 coming up here on the 8th, Sherry has also played in 6 NHL seasons in his career having played in 378 games where he has 172 points on 86 goals and 86 assists. So definitely more points production than what we saw from Hathaway. But also with his smaller frame at just 5 foot 8, he definitely does not offer anywhere near the physical type of game that Hathaway does as his career of 154 is kind of more what you see from Hathaway in a single season rather than over the course of a career. But even with him, again, somewhat understandably avoiding the physical aspect of the game a little bit more than your typical player even would, he still does have pretty respectable possession metrics as he has a career Corsi 4 percentage of 52.3 and never has had a season where he was below 50 at the end of it. So again, especially considering the fact that he isn't even a half a point per game type of player over the course of his career, this certainly wouldn't be a headline making type of pick and he isn't likely to head up a first or second line for the Kraken, but he could be a pretty solid depth option for them and again comes on a very solid contract that's friendly for the team where he's making under a million dollars through 2023 per year, which is quite a bit of cap space wiggle room that the Kraken are then left with to make some moves in free agency to find those top line forwards, or as close as they can get to them anyway. As far as any potential younger forward options, more a prospect level pick that the Kraken could go for from the Capitals, again, this is one of the older rosters in the NHL, and it definitely shows when it comes to young depth, as there really isn't much, especially when it comes to guys that could potentially be tempting pickups for the Kraken. Really, the only guy that I could even see the Kraken taking a chance at would be Garrett Pilon. Taken in the third round of the 2016 entry draft by the Capitals, Pilon has been right around a half a point per game player in the AHL over his first couple of years there. But at least this season, he did have a little bit more of a breakout where he had 16 points in 14 games. Though that did come on just two goals and 14 assists, but still it's over a point per game, which is certainly an improvement over what he had shown in his first couple of years in the AHL. In the WHL, before that, he had been well over a point per game, but... Again, they were still waiting to see that improvement at the next level. On the defensive end for the Capitals, like on the forward end, there are a number of guys, regardless of who they protect, that will be exposed with contracts, so at least as far as exposure requirements are concerned, the Capitals have not a lot to worry about. 
but there also are not a ton of options that I think the Kraken are going to be particularly tempted by. Really, the only guy I could even see them potentially going with on the defensive end would be Brendan Dillon. But even though he certainly would offer a pretty strong veteran presence and is definitely another physical player that could fit the Kraken's play style and has decent possession stats, at 30 years old and on a contract that still sees him earning nearly $4 million a year through 2024, I'm just not sure that he's going to be the best option the Kraken can go with, regardless of who is exposed on the forward end. But I certainly wouldn't necessarily be angry to see the Kraken pick him, and again, unless one of the guys I have protected ends up exposed, he probably is the best and really only tempting option on the defensive end, so if the Kraken want a defenseman here, then he's probably the pick. I suppose there also is Trevor Van Riemsdyk on the defensive end here, so if the Kraken were to get JVR from the Flyers, they could have a brother duo, which would be kind of fun, I guess, but... There's really no other reason to pick up Trevor, so that's obviously not going to happen. Plus, as Vancouver Canucks fans know, having brothers on the same team doesn't necessarily win you Stanley Cups. So, yeah, there's probably no reason for the Kraken to do that. Was that an unnecessary shot at the Canucks? Yeah, probably, but rivalry's got to start somewhere. As far as any potential trades with the Capitals, well... There certainly are all sorts of possibilities here. The Capitals have no shortage of contracts that aren't going to be aging particularly well. The problem is that most of those contracts are also tied to guys that are currently playing pretty well, and again, if they want to try to win a Stanley Cup in the next couple of years, they need to keep those guys around. But the hellhounds of Cap Hell are definitely going to be catching up with the Capitals here in a couple of years if they don't figure out a way to shed a couple of those longer contracts on older players. So it'll be interesting to see how the Capitals handle that situation, but I kind of think that they're more looking to kick that ball down the road and deal with it in a couple of years. Plus, on top of all that, even if the Capitals were to want to make a trade, figuring out what they would trade the Kraken in exchange would also be an interesting puzzle for them to figure out, as they don't have quite as deep of a prospect pool as a number of other teams do, and they also are somewhat lacking in the draft pick department as they don't have this year's first or seventh round picks and are also missing next year's second. And with that being the case, I'm sure there are a whole number of different opinions out there that you guys might have as far as who you think that this team will expose, protect, and who the Kraken should take from them. So I'd love to hear those thoughts down in the comment section below. Otherwise, if you have made it to this point, as always, thank you very much for watching. If you did like or enjoy this video, there are buttons for that kind of stuff down below. Otherwise, stay safe out there and be good to each other. Peace.